Hey AP Psych students, Megan here with Fiveable tonight to review with you the Motivation, Emotion, Stress, and Health Unit Part 1. The main focus here is basically understanding how our actions and emotions as humans impact us in our lives. Like I said, it's 8 to 10% of the AP exam, so there's a lot of content here to cover. Um, and the first part that we're going to focus on today is strictly about motivation. So we're going to talk about the different theories of motivation and why and how they explain what we do. And so to get started, the four main theories of motivation that we're going to talk about today are the instinct theory, the drive reduction theory, optimal arousal theory, and hierarchy of needs. Each of these has some pros and some cons, and so um, none of them by themselves are going to offer us a complete explanation of why we do what we do as humans, and so we kind of have to know them all to give us a better, more well-rounded picture of our actions and what we do. So I'm just going to go in order through them, kind of talk through the theory, talk about some of the pros and some of the cons. So instinct theory. If you know what an instinct is, you probably can figure out what instinct theory says. Basically, instinct theory is tied really closely to the perspective of evolutionary psychology. And it says that basically we do things because we're instinctually like obligated to do them. Um, we do them because they help with our survival. It's an unlearned thing that we do. And um, this is obviously going to be a little bit more common in animals, but some basic instincts that psychologists would identify from the evolutionary perspective would be like a maternal instinct or how infants have the rooting reflex. We looked at that in the development unit. Remember, if you touch a baby on its cheek, it searches for um, its food source. And so you don't teach a baby that, right? Babies are born knowing that. So that's an instinct. And so according to this theory, we do what we do as humans due to these instinctual drives or instinctual feelings that we are born with that we have. Um, hunger is also an instinct in some ways. Sex for like procreation of the species. All of those things can be explained with the instinct theory. However, the downfall of this theory is that it doesn't explain everything that we do. It doesn't explain why do I work hard at my job. Um, it doesn't explain why I like to play sports. Things like that aren't explained through this model and therefore it's not a complete picture of who we are and what we do as humans. So basically evolutionary psychologists would say our genes predispose us to certain behaviors. So maybe my genetics makes me a competitive person and makes me want to play sports and do those certain things. And so that's kind of related then to this like idea of evolution and instinct. But again, not a whole picture. So if you understand what an instinct is, I think this one is pretty, pretty straightforward and easy to understand. The second theory that gets into motivation and why I do what I do is um, drive reduction theory. This one's a pretty common one and it explains a lot of what we do. And so a drive is basically when a physiological need creates an aroused state. Now that sounds confusing and it sounds complicated, but think about the things that you need to survive. I need water, I need food, things like that. And so when I get into an aroused state, that means I'm thirsty, basically, or I'm hungry. That's my like aroused state. The need of food is creating that drive of thirst. And so in the drive reduction theory, what I'm trying to do is get rid of that aroused state. I'm trying to get rid of the thirst. I'm trying to get rid of the feeling of hunger. So what do I do to get rid of the feeling of thirst? I drink a glass of water. And so that's the reduction of the drive. And that's basically what this whole theory is, is that our bodies want to be in a state of homeostasis, um, of being like equal or balanced, right? And so when I get out of whack or out of balance, I want to do something to put myself back into balance, take a drink of water, eat some food, control my body temperature in some way by putting on an extra jacket um, when it's cold outside, things like that. And so the need creates the drive, which then leads to the drive reduction. Um, 
So usually like if you see this question on an AP test, it's going to be related to probably food or water. That's probably the most common way you would see it. So if you understand how that works, you should be good. However, there's like a little caveat there that can also impact our drive reduction theory. Things called incentives um, are any sort of environmental stimuli which can further increase our drive. So, um, for example, maybe I'm laying on the couch, I'm watching TV, and I'm a little bit hungry, but not so much that I'm going to, like, get up and go to the kitchen and get a cookie. However, maybe I'm a little bit hungry, laying on the couch, watching TV, and my mom starts baking cookies. And that smell of the freshly baked cookies comes into the living room. That is going to increase my drive. And I'm going to then be more compelled to reduce that drive by going into the kitchen and eating a cookie. It kind of propels me forward in that drive reduction behavior. This part of the theory involves learning. I have to learn to associate that smell of fresh cookies with then the taste of cookies and the reduction of my feeling of hunger. I have to learn to associate those things. So the drive reduction theory is really made up of both nature and nurture, which is important to understand. The nature part is like the physiological needs that we experience for food and for water and things like that. But then there's the nurture factor of environmental stimuli that we learn to associate with these drives, propelling us and compelling us to do certain things. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If you need me to clarify further, you know, let me know. But I think that that kind of wraps up drive reduction theory as well. The third theory that explains our motivation as humans to do certain things is the optimal arousal theory. And so this one is almost counterintuitive to the drive reduction theory that we just talked about, because this one, we want that arousal. We want that like agitated state to help propel us and do something. So in this case, we're talking about motivated behaviors increasing our arousal. And so if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Why as human beings are we curious? Why do we try to explore the moon and Mars? And why do we create art and discover all of these great things? That has to do with having our basic needs met. So the optimal arousal theory basically relies on the drive reduction theory. Once our body is in this state of homeostasis and we've kind of accomplished that neutrality that we look for, then we as humans can do these other things we can explore and create and discover by finding some arousal outside of our like body state of tension, right? Outside of our thirst and our hunger and things like that. And so what this theory talks about is that we don't want to eliminate completely arousal in our lives because then we just be like lumps, like laying there. We would never have anything interesting happening. We just kind of be lull, right? Nothing too exciting because lack of stimulation leads us to boredom and too much stimulation, we don't want to go too far in the other direction because then we're like nervous Nellies, we're stressful, we're, we're freaking out, we're anxious, things like that. And so to function best as humans, we need a little bit of tension, but not too much. We want to find that right amount. And the key vocab that's associated with this is this Yerkes-Dodson law. And this is pretty important. I would make sure you know this. Um, and the Yerkes-Dodson law says that my performance at any given task is going to increase as my arousal increases up to a certain point. But then if I start having too much arousal, then my performance will decrease. And that's what this picture is showing us um, on the slide. If we're too, um, too low, if we have too low of arousal, we're sleepy, we're bored, we're not doing anything. If we're too stressed out, we have anxiety, disorganization. So we have to find this middle ground that makes us successful. And if I think about it like playing basketball, I used to play basketball. I don't play basketball while well I'm yawning and I'm bored and like whatever, because I'm not competitive and I don't care. Like I'm not going to play my best basketball. But if I'm trying to shoot free throws and the game's on the line, I also can't be way too far aroused in the other direction. My hands are shaking. I'm sweaty. I can't even hold the basketball because I won't be able to shoot the free throw either. So having that like proper amount of like excitement and ready to go, that level of arousal that allows peak performance is what we're looking for. 
Same thing on test day. If you go into an exam and you're sleepy and you're out of it, you know, you might not be thinking clearly and you won't probably do as well on the test. Or if you get really nervous for tests and you're shaking, um, you can barely hold the pencil in your hand, you're probably not going to be able to think clearly and do well. So we want to find whatever for you, and it's different for our, for different people, but we have to find that level of like peak performance. So we don't want to go too far in either direction. And that's the yerkes dodson law, finding that level of peak performance so that we're not too stressed or we're not too bored. All right. And then the fourth main theory here that's going to, oops, I'm going to skip. Well, we'll talk about this briefly, is going to involve our hierarchy of needs. And so we have various motives that explain why we do something. And a lot of them are biological in nature. We've talked about hunger and thirst. We've talked a little bit about sex and temperature. We haven't talked a ton about sleep and rest, but those are all things that can go into the drive reduction theory, right? If I'm tired, how do I reduce the drive of being tired? I go to sleep and then I feel better. I've reached homeostasis. And then activity and aggression can kind of fall into that optimal arousal theory that we've talked about. But a lot of those motives on the right-hand side, the social motives, can't be explained by those theories. Why do I want to play or feel affiliation with another group or experience um, autonomy and working towards something? Like, why do I feel those things? And so the fourth theory gets at this. And this is the hierarchy of needs. This, this um, pyramid or hierarchy appears in a few different units, so maybe you've seen it already. But basically, according to this theory of motivation, that we have an inborn and innate, a genetic kind of natural sense that we want to fulfill our potential. And so everyone's goal, according to this theory, is to reach the top of that pyramid, that self-transcendence. We're not all going to get there, but we all have that desire and that motivation to do that. And in order to reach that tippy top of the pyramid, I need a supportive environment to do so. I need certain things to go right in my life for me to get there. And so at the base of the pyramid, before I can do anything else in life, I have to have my physiological needs met, meaning my hunger, my thirst, my like basic things that I need to function and be alive have to be taken care of, right? I can't transcend beyond myself if I'm starving or if I'm thirsty. And so basically, you have to accomplish each level of this hierarchy before you can get to the top. So the physiological needs relate a lot to that drive reduction theory that we had previously talked about. But a lot of these are kind of their own thing. And this relates more to like circumstances or to like specific events. And so the, the two kind of top or peak, the peak part of the pyramid talks about self-actualization. And so this is when you like realize your fullest potential. And not everybody gets there, right? Not everybody is the best person that they can be in life. And so um, that doesn't mean they're not trying to be, but not everyone can get there because sometimes you lose your job or you might be homeless for a while or your girlfriend breaks up with you. And so you're me. Um, your feeling of belonging and love is missing. And so we don't always move upwards. And it's also not a continuous process. Sometimes we go down a step and then back up some steps and we can bounce around throughout our lives. But basically, this pyramid explains why we feel a need for belonging because before we can self-actualize and self-transcend, I need to have that feeling of love and acceptance and belonging. I need to feel self-esteem and achievement and recognition before I can be self-actualized. So this explains a lot of that other kind of, I almost would call it like wishy-washy motivations that don't have a clear biological or instinctual mechanism. It explains a lot of our social and other kind of motivational needs. And so this chart which is a little bit blurry for some reason now. Um, I can attach this later as a document um, for you guys if you go into the notes and if you want to look at this textbook. It is in the Myers textbook, but it's just a really good, I think, summary of all four different motivational theories. It tells you its strengths 
it tells you its weaknesses. And so I think if you're studying kind of the bare minimum of stuff, this would be a good place to start. But I do see that it is a bit blurry for some reason when I made it bigger. So I will try to make a copy of it and throw it in the resource tab when you register for like these AP Psych sessions, it will be in there. So those are the specific theories that talk about our motivation. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about specific motivators like hunger and sex and achievement because those are all part of this unit and so there's specific kind of things you need to know about each one. So for hunger motivation, I like this quote. It says, when we're hungry, thirsty, fatigued, or sexually aroused, little else matters. And so I think that's important because when our needs aren't met, when this kind of relates to that drive reduction theory, when I'm hungry or thirsty, I can't concentrate on anything else because that is like my primary need, my primary drive at that point. And so until I fix that, there's going to, I'm not going to be able to concentrate in school or play my instrument or whatever it is, work at my job, do the thing that I'm going to do. Um, and so hunger is one of the, I think, really big motivators that we see because there's a lot of hormones involved and there's a lot of body, like physiological changes that happen inside of myself when um, you reach that state of hunger. And so it's a pretty powerful force, um, which we will discuss. So the physiology behind hunger, so the actual physical things happening in my body that help explain hunger, there's a few things. You need to know that glucose is like a resource, and our body keeps track of our glucose levels. And so when the glucose and the insulin levels increase or decrease as we feel hunger or not, messages are going to get sent to your brain telling you to eat or not eat depending on what's happening. And so when your blood sugar level decreases, you don't physically feel it in your body. Um, but what happens is as those numbers start to decrease, the glucostats, those are like, I like to think of them almost as like statisticians. They keep the stats of your glucose. Um, send the message to your brain telling you, uh-oh, it's time to eat. And then your brain tells your stomach to like grumble or rumble, which is a signal for you to then eat. And so specifically speaking, the part of our brain that we need to associate with hunger is the hypothalamus. And I think that's easy to remember because hypothalamus starts with H, hunger starts with H. So hypothalamus and hunger go together. Um, and so that's what in your brain is triggered when those glucostats are telling you that you're hungry, which then transfers the message to your body telling you that you're hungry. There's two parts of the hypothalamus that are also involved in hunger. So we have to get even more specific here um, into parts of our brain. The lateral hypothalamus tells you when you're hungry. So if I could implant an electrode into your brain, put it in the lateral hypothalamus and then stimulate it, you would start feeling hungry and you would want to eat. And I could make you um, really, really fat and just keep stimulating it. Even if your stomach is like so full, like if that is triggered, you're gonna wanna eat and eat and eat. And they've done this with lab rats. Lab rats will eat until like severe, severe obesity if they keep stimulating their lateral hypothalamus because it's telling their body that they're hungry whether they're not actually hungry or not. If I destroyed your lateral hypothalamus, this is the thing that makes you start eating you would never want to eat. You would never feel hungry. Um, and you would never, um, you would just never eat. Um, and so that's also problematic. Like rats that have had that destroyed would never eat and they would like starve because they never felt hungry or the need for food. The ventral medial hypothalamus um, suppresses your hunger. So if I stimulate that, you'll stop eating, you won't feel hungry. And then if I destroy that, that's your signal that says, stop, stop, you're full, you're full. So if you never feel stop, 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 you're full, what are you going to do? You're going to eat and eat and eat and eat until the point of extreme obesity. And so how I kind of keep track of lateral versus ventromedial is um, this meme. But remember that L lateral comes in the alphabet before V, ventromedial. So you have to start eating 
before you can stop eating. So L lateral is the starting point, comes first in the, in the alphabet, and the V ventromedial is the stopping point, which comes second in the alphabet. Um, and so the other thing is like Latin, um, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, but that's how I teach the, my students to remember that. So I think that is probably the most useful way. So that was the physiology of hunger, the physical things happening in my body that drive my want to eat or not to eat. There's also psychology like happening in your head, right? That drives our hunger. So our taste preferences come from both our biology and our environment. So for example, in the sensation and perception unit, you learned about like taste buds and like the biological reasons why we might avoid like bitter or sour foods because of like poison and things like that and why we like sugary or meat rich foods. So those are biological factors that drive our taste preferences. But environmental factors are also important. Um, I always start out this unit by showing um, my students pictures of food that we might think is like weird or yucky in our culture. And so a lot of times I show them there's like in markets in different places in Asia, you can get like rats on a skewer or big snakes on a skewer. And that's considered like a snack food, right? Like we walk around with like a corn dog on a stick, similar idea. We look at those pictures and it's like, oh, yuck, I would never eat that. But if you grew up in that environment and that was seen as normal as part of your culture, your taste preferences, you wouldn't have. Other ways that our environment can impact our psychology of our hunger when we feel sad, um, you know, like the old trope in like movies when a woman is broken up with and she's like crying and she's like eating ice cream or something like that. There's a little bit of truth to that. When we're depressed, um, we actually can crave carbs because when I eat carbs, my brain produces and releases more serotonin. And what does serotonin do? <sighs> it makes me feel good and it makes me feel happy. And so sometimes when we're in that depressed state, when we do eat those carbs, our brain actually is compensating and making us feel better. So basically stress can in lead to, in some cases, increased eating, which is like a psychological factor for hunger. Um, there's obviously other reasons with stress and hunger and things like that, too. But that's one of the linkages that we can make. Um, I talked about the culture aspect a little bit already about how our culture influences what we think is yucky or gross or what we think is acceptable. And then we also have learned preferences and habits. And so my example here is fish with the yucky face. I hate fish. I will not touch fish. I hate the smell of it. Everything about any kind of fish or seafood grosses me out. And so I wasn't always that way. Um, as a kid, I liked fish. I ate it all the time. My parents talk about it. It's like this whole thing. But one day I decided that I didn't like fish anymore. And I actually don't even know why I just made this decision that I don't like fish. But now every time that like my family is eating fish and I'm around, it's like they like try to goad me into trying it. Come on, you like it, you'll love it, blah, blah, blah. And it's such a learned preference now. And I'm so adamant that I don't like fish that I absolutely refuse to try it. So it's like my learned habit and my reaction is preventing me psychologically from wanting to try that food and eat that food. And so there's factors like that. Another example might be you got really sick once from eating a food, like maybe you got like food poisoning or something. And so now the thought of eating that same food again, like grosses you out. And so psychologically speaking, that's influenced your hunger, or your attitude towards that certain food, whatever it was. So before we start talking about sex, I do wanna go back to hunger for just a second. I'll leave this slide up, but talking about hunger, your book, or at least my textbook, also talks a little bit about eating disorders and um, obesity and, um, anorexia, bulimia, those sorts of things. Um, you should familiarize yourself with them, um, at least knowing kind of what they are and some of the risk factors for them. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them because they come up again in um, some other units, but make sure you've at least looked at them and know what they are. So the second like large motivator that is discussed in this unit is sex. And Sex is a physiologically based motive. So again, it comes from like within our bodies. So it's similar to hunger. However, it is not a need. Whereas like if I don't eat food, I will eventually die. 
if I don't have sex, I'm not going to die. Um, so it's not a need in that regard. But if you're an evolutionary psychologist, you would argue that it is a need because if you're an evolutionary psychologist, it's all about survival of the species. So in some ways it's a need, but it's not in others. So hopefully you understand kind of the, the difference in perspective there. And so just like um, when we talked about hunger, there's both physiological, internal, um, and psychological, which has some external factors that um, motivate us towards um, sexual behavior. And we need to look at both of the physiological and the psychological factors to understand that. So the first thing, the physiology, um, Masters and Johnson, you need to know those names. They're famous um, researchers and they researched sex. And what they did was they literally had like men and women have sex <laughs> and they measured the different like bodily responses that were going on while intercourse was happening. And what they discovered was that there's four main phases to the sexual response cycle. And again, I'm not going to talk a ton about this. I don't know how much they teach you in school. I think most of you have like health. So, but understanding that there's an excitement phase. So that's when like your arousal is increasing. There's a plateau, then there's orgasm, and then the resolution phase. And I have seen questions about this before on the exam. So just kind of knowing the order that these things go in. The other thing is that men have a refractory period and women don't really have that. So before you can start the cycle again, men have to like wait a little bit, whereas women typically don't. And so that's sometimes a question that might pop up is like comparing the refractory period between men and women in the sexual response cycle. The other thing that they discovered that's like a physiological characteristic in, um, in the sexual response cycle is that there is really no difference happening within like the brain and body. So they measured like PET scans and different things to see um, how sex was experienced like in your brain. They had people write about the experience. They had them like look at loved ones and measure the experience. And all of the same time, the experience was the same, whether you were a man or a woman in your brain. So there's not really a difference in how our brains perceive it. So there's no like gender difference that way. The cycle itself has a little bit of a gender difference in the refractory period, but like in the brain, it looks the same. There are two main hormones that you have to know, estrogen and testosterone. Estrogen is the female sex hormone. And so on this chart below, you can see that a female cycle the levels of the different hormones vary throughout her monthly cycle. And so estrogen peaks around ovulation for women. Um, this is when you're supposed to be like most receptive to the sexual response cycle. And so like animals will like instinctually know to reproduce at this time. Um, it's not so much a thing in women as it is in like in human women as it is in like mammals or other animals, but it is sort of a thing. And so that's the time when like reproduction can happen. Men, on the other hand, um, are, well, actually both men and women have testosterone. So that's one thing that you need to know. Um, that's a trick question that I've seen sometimes that they'll say something about testosterone and you assume it's only referencing men. Both men and women have testosterone. Men just have more of it. So that's a, that's a tricky thing to remember. So if we were to look at men's testosterone levels, theirs remains pretty much the same. There's like slight fluctuations, but it's not like how we see here on the female hormone chart where there's like peaks and valleys. For a man, their hormone level is pretty consistent. Um, testosterone, there's little interest in sex, and this is for both men and women. So if you've ever seen lately on TV, there's these like low T commercials, low testosterone. And then there's like pills that you can take. Literally, it's a testosterone pill to make people have more interest in sexual intercourse because for whatever reason, their levels are low and so they need that boost. Um, the levels can fluctuate in men and women in regard or in men particular to like sexual stimulation. But again, it's not gonna be like monthly changes how we see in women. So those are kind of the physiological factors that you need to understand that go into why humans are driven to have sexual intercourse. Um, on the other hand, there's psychological factors 
that go into it. And so if you look at the psychological one, which is the right hand, upper right hand corner bullet point, those are things like being exposed to certain conditions, thinking about sexual intercourse, things like that can influence how you feel about it. We also could be influenced the other way as well, like your religious beliefs and things like that could influence how you perceive sex. If you were raised, <clears throat> excuse me, in an environment where, you know, like sex before marriage is very frowned upon, um, it's seen as um, like a religious thing, then you probably have a very different attitude or thought process towards sex than someone who wasn't raised in that sort of environment. So again, like our thoughts and our, our culture can impact how we view these different things. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about today is motivation in regards to achieving like goals and being successful. Ooh, I just about dropped my computer. Sorry. Um, and so I do this thing called the quarter toss game with my students. I set up like a, um, you know, like a red solo cup somewhere in the classroom. And then I give the kids three quarters and I say, toss this in the cup. And I don't give them any other instructions. And so some kids will look at me kind of confused and they'll go and stand and just literally drop the three quarters in the cup. Other kids who maybe are a little more competitive will take a couple steps back um, and then try and throw them in and make a couple or miss some. And then like kind of my real competitive or high achieving kids will go stand way back and throw the quarters in. And then we talk about how they feel afterwards. Did you feel a sense of accomplishment, a sense of success? a challenge, things like that. And so what they say is, right, if I stood right above the cup and just went quarter, quarter, quarter and dropped it in, do I feel good about that? No, probably not. I don't feel successful. I don't feel like I've done anything special. The kids who stood further back, if they made a quarter, they're like excited about it. The class cheers them on. It's like a woohoo type thing. And so Bernard Wiener did a similar experiment to this in 1972. And what he discovered was that it wasn't about how many times I got the quarter into the cup, but it was about how far away I stood that mattered to how I felt about it. So I felt better about my experience and my result, the more challenging it was, not about how many times I made it in, but whether or not I achieved like through that challenge. He also discovered that people who often have a low motivation or a low drive stood the closest to it. And people who are like high achievers, highly motivated for achievement, stood about an intermediate distance because they wanted a challenge, but they didn't want to make it so hard that they failed because nobody wants to feel like a failure. And so this gives us some insight into what drives people and what motivates people to feel success is that that feeling of achievement, but not like too much pressure, kind of relates to that optimal arousal theory, right? We want to find that right level of, of um, difficulty that makes that achievement feel worthwhile. And so specifically speaking, achievement motivation is this idea of like accomplishment, whether it's mastering like a thing, if you play an instrument, maybe it's a difficult concerto that you're trying to learn, or Maybe it's AP psychology, the ideas in psychology, you're trying to master those. It's also this idea of achieving a high standard. Maybe I don't have to necessarily conquer something, but maybe I just have certain standards about the way things are done and I would like to achieve those things. So if you think about this and you think about what achievement motivation, think about your own personal goals. Think about how you measure your achievement because we all do it differently. It's a very personal Thing. There's no like set bar of what achievement means because it's different for everyone. Um, and think about how you would measure then your success in the future and whether or not you would gauge that achievement and that feeling of success in your future. And then the last kind of thing to think about is, do people sometimes protect themselves against failure by taking the easy way out or by guaranteeing failure? And I would say, yes, that's true. For example, people who are more afraid of failure might be more likely to stand right next to the cup and drop the three quarters in because they've taken the easy way out. They've ensured like success, right? But it's not true success. They didn't do anything challenging. Or have you ever like worked with someone or had someone competing with you for something? And then when it becomes apparent that maybe they're not going to be successful, they say, well, I didn't want to do that anyways, or I didn't care about that award or that, that game or that whatever anyways. 
And so it's a way that we protect ourselves when we realize we aren't going to reach our achievement in a certain situation to um, make ourselves feel better. Like that thing, whatever it is, wasn't that important to us in the long run. Motivation in regards to achievement can also be affected by incentives. So we talked about incentives earlier in regards to drive reduction. We can also talk about them in regards to motivation. So an incentive in this case is an external, um, external stimuli being added into the situation. And there's two types of ways that this could be used. Um, sometimes parents give you money for good grades, right? So if your mom says, I'll give you $5 for every A on your report card, then basically as a kid, you're like, well, as long as she pays, I'm going to study hard and do well. That leads to what's called extrinsic motivation. Basically, our motivation is pushed by external controlling factors. So things outside of myself. I don't want to study because I like to study. I want to study because I want that money. And so you're not doing it for the pleasure of doing it or because you want to necessarily feel a sense of achievement. You're doing it for the reward or for the external circumstance in that situation. So that's extrinsic motivation. On the other hand, your mom looks at your report card. She hasn't offered you any money. She looks at your first quarter report card and she says, oh my gosh, your grades were so great. Let's celebrate by going out to dinner. You then, as the child or as a student, think, gosh, I love doing well. It feels so good getting good grades. That's more of an intrinsic motivator. It comes from inside you, that feeling you get, that good thing, that you enjoy it because of, of what it brings you. I enjoy studying because of these good things, because it makes me feel good, that sort of thing. And so there's both extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. Um, Generally speaking, we would say that intrinsic motivation is better because if you can find that motivation to achieve inside yourself, then that's always going to be there. Whereas your mom's not going to be around when you're 40 to give you $5 for doing a good job at work every day, right? Um, so sometimes we would like we would see that intrinsic motivators are better because they're longer lasting. They're for the joy of the task themselves. And so how do we motivate people? In like work or in jobs, you'll see this, you know, some of you probably have jobs already. You could think about whether your boss does one of these factors. There's two main kind of ways that bosses can motivate us in our jobs. One is theory X and one is theory Y. So a theory X style manager is very authoritarian. They're very repressive. They have a lot of control over their employees. Um, and so a lot of times, these workplaces are much more rigid and strict. And because the belief here is that employees are just going to take advantage of the system. And so we have to watch them carefully and make sure they do what we say. Um, so it's very strict, very structured, very authoritarian. This tends to not get the best results, right? Think about it when your teachers are really like strict and rigid and don't let you have any freedom or choice. You don't really probably perform as well as when Teachers, on the other hand, are more liberated and developmentally nature, developmentally nurturing, things like that. So theory why management starts with management kind of delegating and letting the staff kind of have freedom and choice. And it enables them to make decisions and gives them responsibility because it trusts their employees to do what they want and to um, achieve on their own. Whereas theory X is all about I'm telling you what to do and you all have to do the same exact thing as I'm telling you. Theory Y is much more open, collaborative, exploratory, things like that. So we would say that we would like to probably see theory Y as a better management style in regards to motivating people to be successful. And then the very last, this is my last slide tonight, so if you have any last questions you want to throw them in there yet, um, is social motivation. So we've talked a little bit about this in regards to the hierarchy of needs that we looked at before, but what motivates me to have friends? Like, why do I feel like I need to have friends and go out and socialize and have fun? Well, evolutionarily speaking, we're going back to evolution again, being social benefited my chance of survival for a few reasons. One, if I'm not social, I can't reproduce. Number two, being in like a group protected me from like lions and tigers and dangerous things out in the wild that could kill me, right? So 
So being social was a human survival tactic. And so those sorts of things have been left over in our DNA and our genetics, according to evolutionary psychologists, to make us want to still do those things, have social, social groups that we hang out with. Today, being social also offers us some perks in regards to why we might want to be social. It increases our feeling of belonging. Um, conforming to group standards makes us feel like we fit in, like we have people who are similar to us who can experience and relate with us. Um, we also become close to those we spend time around. So we're going to look at this a little bit more in some of the social psych units. But just like being around somebody makes you feel closer to them. The more time you spend with someone, the more you relate to them, the more you care about them. And so think about like the people you sit next to in class every day. You know, as the year goes on, you probably warm up to them a little bit more just because of the fact that you sit next to them every day. And so it makes saying goodbye in some cases really hard. And so that um, graphic that I have on this page actually demonstrates that. So this guy uh, was wearing a Fitbit, you know, per minute, and his girlfriend called and broke up with him around noon. And so you can see that throughout his morning, he was at baseline heart rate. And then his girlfriend called and broke up with him. And all of a sudden, look at his heart rate. It's peaking. It's all over the place. It's jagged. It's up. It's down. And so that's like a physiological response to like a social, a social hurt. And so it kind of draws I guess, evidence to the fact that we have that feeling of needing to feel belonging and loved and secure. And when that's being taken away, there's actual physiological things happening in my body that are expressing that pain and that hurt that we feel. Um, we also know that love activates reward centers in our brain. So when we feel loved and secure, parts of our brain that make us feel safe and secure light up and we feel better. And we also know that early on in relationships, like as a child, if you lack those um, like secure parenting and things like that, later on you have mistrust and you have harder times forming those social bonds. So your social motivation may be lacking. So that's kind of the gist of why we feel social motivation, kind of evolutionary speaking, and how it like benefits or protects us even today in our society. So that is all I really have tonight for motivation. Follow us on Crowdcast YouTube. We have fun videos like that. We have a student Facebook page. And then make sure you always register for live upcoming events. Bring any questions you have next week. I'd love to see you all back here. And if you have questions from the motivation unit, maybe you have a test coming up and you're confused about something, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So otherwise, I'm glad you guys were here tonight. I will see you next week. Have a good one. Bye.